1928 hurricane might very well be the most underreported natural disaster in the history of the United States. In fact, in order to talk about just about everything in the history of South Florida, you have to talk about the lake. And people who don't live in Florida say, well, what do you mean the lake? What's the name of the lake? And here in Florida, you don't have to say which lake you're talking about. Lake Okeechobee is one of the largest lakes in the world. It is so huge that it's got, I think, enough water for every man, woman, and child in the world, like three times over. It is so gigantic, you can see it from space. If you stand on one shore, you can in no way see the other end of it. It is as inextricably linked to the history of Florida as is any other thing. The word Okeechobee means big water right? because the Indians were very pragmatic and that's what it is. It is big water and it affected everything because when you look at the history of Florida, water affects everything. So once the Everglades were drained and people decided that they wanted to start farming in the interior, they discovered an unpleasant truth, which was that Lake Okeechobee had a shore and the water just kind of oozed out of it. When there was a storm or a wind event, the water oozed out of it maybe a little more strongly than you'd like and maybe washed out your crops. Or if it was a strong enough storm, the water knocked your house down. We have to remember that early on, we are not talking about the hundreds of thousands of acres of sugar that are now run by corporations. We're talking about mom and pops growing peppers and corn and things like that. And so they had been encouraged to come in by the state and, and, and start turning this swamp, which had been drained, into a thriving farming area, which as we all know, it, it was and is today. You know, the joke is if you having a salad in New Jersey, it probably came from Palm Beach County. So these farmers came in, but they started complaining to the state and to the feds. And they said, every time we have a storm event, the, the water comes out of the lake because there's nothing to stop it. And there's a lot of water. And if it's a strong enough wind event, the water just comes pouring out and, 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 and you need to do something about it. Well, in the history of nature, we all know that when confronted with these situations, humankind has, has two options. One is to abandon the whole thing back to nature. They never do that. So someone said, well, we'll just put a berm around the lake. A six foot high berm made out of the muck. Well, that'll withhold anything, right? Six foot berm made out of clay. That shouldn't be a problem. So the farmers were like, okay, we'll give that a try. Then in 1926, there was a horrific hurricane in Miami. Uh, the storm was, was, was horrific. It struck a Miami that was much smaller than it is now by, by many, many degrees. Uh, it ended the boom, which was pretty much on the way out already, but the, this kind of hastened things. Uh, people were, they gave away free train rides out of town and they, every train was leaving full with every guy that had come down there to make a quick buck selling uh, property because the property was now on, underwater or smashed or both. And that's what everybody remembers about the 26 hurricane. But what, lot, but what a lot of people don't know about the 26 hurricane is that after it finished smashing Miami, it went up to the lake. There's a town called Moorhaven. And the lake's not a perfect circle, but if you look at it, you can kind of make a circle out of it and pretend it's a clock. Moorhaven was at about eight o'clock southwest part of the lake. And the hurricane came up and it washed out this little six foot muck berm and killed about 600 people. Just flooded downtown Moorhaven, which at the time was a pretty decent sized boom town. Uh, it's, it's not much there now, it's a much smaller town. Uh, and drowned all these people. Well, this was unacceptable. So everybody got together and they had a bunch of committees and they had committees for committees. And they said, we need to decide whether to abandon the interior to nature or build a bigger dike. And this went on for two years. And somebody got up and said, 
You know, we've been arguing about this for two years now. What if another hurricane comes while we're arguing and we haven't built the dike yet? And somebody stood up and said, well, that's not going to happen. What are the odds of a hurricane hitting the same place two years apart? Back then, the first they heard about this hurricane was about three and a half days before it struck Florida. A ship ran into it and somehow survived and said, well, there's this monster storm. So the hurricane ripped through all those little tiny islands, Montserrat and uh, uh, Virgin Islands, and then it came to Puerto Rico, the, uh, the island from east to west, right along the spine of mountains, which meant that everything flooded down one side and down the other, drowned hundreds and hundreds of people. And then people in Florida started looking at it. But everybody, the National Weather Service said, nope, 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 this thing is going to come off Puerto Rico and it's going to do what all these hurricanes do, which is curve up to the north, go up through the middle of Atlantic, come close to Canada, get into that cold water, and race to its death in the chilly waters of the North Atlantic Ocean. Well, in 1928, the Miami Weather Service said, this hurricane will not strike Florida. Saturday night, the National Weather Service put out a new advisory, which was a little more tempered and it had these ominous words, recurve not yet indicated. So even on Saturday night, when they said, uh-oh, the hurricane is gonna hit Florida, the best the newspaper could do was put it in the Sunday morning paper, which landed in the driveway and promptly flew away in a hurricane wind. So the people on the coast start getting word of mouth, yes, yes, oh, the hurricane's gonna hit, oh, the hurricane's gonna hit. So there were some preparations, but keep in mind that even in 1992, Millions of South Floridians who knew that a Category 5 hurricane was coming, the, the extent of their preparation was to put masking tape over their plate glass windows. So the people on the coast could only prepare so much. They could maybe get out, try to get on a train, get on a car, drive up US-1. You know, what are you going to do? Uh, not everybody had a car in 1928. Hard to believe. Now, what about the people in the glades? The hurricane came ashore September 16th, 1928. Ground zero might have been uh, like the Lake Worth West Palm Beach line, but of course, that's not where the worst damage is. The worst damage is north of that in the right front right quadrant. That's where you don't want to be. Hurricane did tremendous damage along the coast, killed many people. A hurricane is a gigantic cyclone. It's really a, gi a giant tornado. And it moves counterclockwise in a big circle, but it also moves just like a tornado does. So this hurricane had to cross only 30 or 40 miles of land. That wasn't going to slow it down. It maybe slowed it down. Some people believe it was a Category 5 at the, at the landfall, and it maybe it slowed it down to a Category 4. All, all the, uh, all the uh, uh, wind meters all blew away, so they don't know what few wind meters there were in 1928. So the hurricane came up, and the north top of this cyclone came around the top of the lake, around where the town of Okeechobee is and came from the north to the south, into the lake. And I've talked to hurricane experts who have said that if it had been daylight, because by the time it got to the lake region, it was already nightfall. Had it been daylight, you probably would have seen fish flopping around on the lake bed in northern, at the northern end of the Lake Okeechobee, off the, coast, off the shore of, 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 of the town of Okeechobee, because it pushed all of the water south. Well, Lake Okeechobee is, what, 18 feet deep at its deepest point? The water had to go somewhere. The water had to go somewhere. So here it comes from the north and it pushes it all the way down to the southeast corner, which is where the only place where there was people. Six foot dike, probably lasted 90 seconds. Water probably got up to 20 feet above sea level, which is 20 feet above anybody's head, and 3,000 people drowned. When I talk about the 28 hurricane, especially in my book, and I talk about, of course, the mechanics of the hurricane, which were horrific, 
But I also make, as I mentioned, I make race as big a part of the story as the hurricane itself, because it was. So there were black families who asked their farm boss, can we stay in your house? No, no, you, you, you folks will have to take your chances out there. And they did. So right away from the very beginning, racism played a part. Plus, these farm workers, uh, most of them didn't have their own homes. They had a little shanty, they had a little shack. Some of them, at the end of the day, they just lay down under a tree, that was their home. In fairness, many white people died too. White farmers died in their homes, and there were white farmers who tried as much as possible to take care of their black workers. You know, for every outrage, there's an exception. But when the hurricane passed through, many, many, many of the victims were poor black migrant workers. Some of these people, their boss didn't even know their last name. And some of them, they just, they don't know what happened to them. They just never found their body. So they're doing the cleanup, and there's just bodies everywhere. And try to imagine it's the middle of September. It's still summer in Florida. It's brutally hot, brutally muggy. This hurricane has come through. There's standing water everywhere. And in the water is busted up houses and rotting sugar cane and rotting peppers and onions and stalks of you know, and trees and dead snakes and dead rabbits and dead animals and dead people. And it, is, it would be a soup that would make any uh, uh, epidemic doctor run for his life in the other direction. But that's what they were dealing with. They took boats out and they were literally pulling people out of the water with a grappling hook or a net, getting them in the boat, getting them to the closest high ground where they put them in a truck and off they went. So people were being buried as quickly as they could for fear of this epidemic. The ones they could get to the coast, some they were able to bury in their own graves, but then they had mass graves. So they created a mass grave in Woodlawn Cemetery, the city cemetery in the back. And it's still there, it's marked. And it of course was only for white victims. And the white victims were tagged when possible. Relatives were allowed to come and try to find them and identify them, which I guess was pretty gruesome, but at least there was closure. And uh, they were buried with a great ceremony in the back of Woodlawn Cemetery. Probably about 65 or 70 white victims. There were about 700 black victims. Well, they have the number at 674, but it may be more. And the reason why those bodies ended up where they did there at the mass grave is because if you've ever been out west to Belle Glade, Pahokee, in that area, it's really lowland. By that, it's very flat. And at the time when the storm came through, they needed a way to bury as many people as they could. There's a field at the corner of Tamarind Avenue and 25th Street, a couple of miles north of downtown West Palm Beach. And that was the pauper's grave yard for the black neighborhoods. So the authorities came in and they just dug a big hole. Dug, just dug a huge pit. And they just dumped in the bodies. No tags, no giving people an opportunity to identify them. The only thing they received was lime. Bodies dumped in covered with lime. The black community did its own ceremony. Mary McLeod Bethune came. And then for the next 60 years, that mass grave was unmarked. And what I tell people is I say, imagine you're standing in a place and under you are 700 of your fellow human beings. And not just 700 people, but 700 victims of the second deadliest natural disaster in US history that nobody ever heard of. I suspect if there were 700 white bodies in that hole, it would have been handled a little differently. At this point, we have a historical marker up there. We have a memorial signage at the site. And of course, we have the four columns that uh, surrounds the, the mass grave itself that says 1928 on it. So people have to understand that Lake Okeechobee and hurricanes are a nasty mix. And the lake is wonderful and benevolent, but when a hurricane comes, 
What kills you in a hurricane is water, water, water. People say, Andrew, this Category 5 hurricane hit one of the largest metropolitan areas in the world, only killed 15 people. 1928 hurricane killed 3,000 people. What's the difference? Water, 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 water. So that's why the dike is critical. And that's why we have to worry about these hurricanes uh, causing flooding, causing uh, the dike to leak, causing the dike to fail. It is a problem that we have to live with.